Good evening and Merry Christmas, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our December 18 special agenda meeting. Uh, before we begin, and as always, please take a moment to silence your phones. And when you're done doing that, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Uh, first order of business, Mr. Hatfield with roll. Okay. President McFarland. Here. Vice President Roush. Here. Secretary Hatfield is here. Treasurer Lauterbach appears to be, is here. <laughs> nice. Good timing. <laughs> Member Blazy. Here. Member Ringgold. Here. Member Horowitz. Here. All right. All right. Fantastic. Uh, moving on to item two. Are there any requests to address the board regarding this facility study workshop? Okay. All right. Uh, we will close the floor then, and let's move right into our presentation. We have item 3.1, our facility study. Penny. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Just a little more formal up here at the podium. Uh, Brian and I are really excited. We're sharing the presentation tonight uh, to share with you the results of our facilities assessment and planning process to date. As you know, this information reflects over a year's worth of work. Oops, I'm getting happy here with this. Uh, over a year's worth of work and analysis and collaboration. We partnered with Barton Mallow and French and Associates for the facilities assessment process. They collected data and helped us organize it in ways that we could analyze it and clearly understand our needs, determine priorities, consider emerging ideas, dream big about our future, and cast a vision for planning. We also carefully considered our responsibility to be the best possible stewards of the current and future resources entrusted to us to educate kids. Brian and I work closely with the facilities, uh, the Finance Facilities and Operations Board Study Committee throughout this process, and that committee, as intended, helped us study the information so that we could generate the ideas necessary uh, to meet our needs, our priorities, and our vision. Thank you to John Lauterbach, Brad Blasey, and John Hatfield for your collaboration so far, and to Brian and the rest of the uh, admin team and others behind the scenes who really helped us work through this process to get us to this point this evening. Uh, we have our friends here, uh, Daryl from Barton Mallow and Dale from French and Associates. They took our ideas and mapped them out so that we could understand the feasibility of each idea. The information presented to you tonight is a product of that specific process. It's also a reflection of our commitment to ensuring a safe, innovative, and conducive learning environment to ensure the success of our students for generations to come. We wholeheartedly believe that our students, our staff, and our entire community deserve to have the facilities that reflect our aspirations to, to the highest level of excellence in everything we do. We live in a community with the vision of together, forward, bold, an exceptional place where everyone thrives. And we know that Midland Public Schools is a critical community partner in achieving that vision and making our community vibrant and strong. Accepting that challenge of being together, forward, and bold, and leaning into our own vision statement, which you can see here on the slide, of leading with respect, trust, and courage ensuring an equitable, collaborative, and inclusive culture so that each student can be successful. That really positions us well to move into this facility planning work. Tonight, we will guide you through a brief history, uh, particularly of our highly successful 2015 bond, followed by an overview of the current needs that we've identified through the facilities assessment. We'll then give you an overview of the current needs, uh, excuse me, and the potential solutions to meet those needs. 
We will then move into sharing possible scenarios that position those solutions in interdependent ways to meet our needs. The scenarios represent the core ideas that we've developed and alternative ways to accomplish our priorities and goals through the lens of facility use. At the end of the presentation, we will share some additional considerations and round out with next steps. And I ask you if you could please hold your questions until the end, at which time we will invite you all to engage in some constructive dialogue. So to set the stage, these are the priorities you see on the screen. These will guide our planning. Maintain critical infrastructure. Address our aging facilities. Consider facility utilization for increased efficiency. Uh, we know there's an emerging trend and a need to expand our pre-K offerings to set our youngest learners up for success. So you see that on our priority list. And of course, we want to enhance our educational opportunities and improve auxiliary programming by providing the best possible facilities. Utilizing key investments is critical and upgrades to art and athletic facilities. You will see this slide repeated throughout the presentation. Uh, I hope it will help you stay grounded in our priorities. It will anchor our thinking about keeping students centered in our, our process. And certainly, I ask you to keep your mind open to the possibilities. Brian is going to take over here and give us a brief history and then move us into some of the planning slides. Thank you, Penny. Thank you, board, for the opportunity to present tonight. I am beyond excited to be able to present to you what is a culmination of almost a year and a half worth of work. Um, as Penny expressed her gratitude, I'd like to express my gratitude to the FFO committee as well too. It's been an exciting journey and truly um, these opportunities only come up a few times in a lifetime to be able to envision what we can do best for the constituents and the students of the Midland Public Schools. Um, as Penny stated, we're proud of the process that we utilized during our 2015 facilities initiative. It's important for us to revisit that process and also to reflect upon what was accomplished as we intend to use that forward momentum as our springboard into what is our new adventure. Uh, it is important though, before we progress into this next information, that I acknowledge for you that the amount of information that you're gonna receive is going to be overwhelming. Um, we've all met, you've known me for 10 years. Brevity is not my strength. I understand that's been in my evaluation repeatedly. So I am going to speed through for me some of these slides um, and I will slow down strategically at the ones that I really think need to be hit home. So we are committed to going into deeper dives within our board subcommittees and within stakeholder groups as well too, but no, to capture 45 minute presentation reflecting a year and a half worth is almost impossible. So please bear with us as we progress. So again, we wanna springboard from our 2015 initiative. And this is a recap of the process that we used for that initiative, which again was highly successful. I'm not gonna go through each and every single one of these, but the participants that were in that 2015 facility study are a reflection of the participants that have been involved with us thus far. It goes from educators to specialized consultants into an interwoven, into an interconnected process. As you can see through the puzzle pieces, all of these pieces build upon each other, and this is an extremely comprehensive, interconnected process that will eventually lead to us proposing a project to the voters. Know that we've put almost $168 million into our facilities over the past 20 years. A lot of that pre-2015 was with our sinking fund, and you can see that we really have doubled down into that investment since our 2015 bond initiative went through. When you have a physical campus the size of Midland Public Schools with the amount of buildings and the fleet that we have, it is necessary to consistently invest in those facilities and upgrade them so you don't hit strategic bubbles where you have to do large bulks of work. Our 2015 bond goals, there were five primary areas of focus. We needed to focus on safety and security. Energy efficiency was a challenge for us. Healthy learning environments needed addressed. We had vacant buildings and properties, and we wanted to modernize our classrooms. 
in safety and security, you've known by visiting our buildings that we were able to put secure entrances in every single one of our buildings. Our video surveillance, thanks to Dave and his team, is now amongst the elite when it comes to, Midland, to, to the public schools. Traffic flow, while we all acknowledge there are still challenges in those areas, I challenge you to reflect back before 2015, if you had to go through some of those drives, believe it or not, it was more challenging than it is now. Um, and also our public address systems, which are related to safety. Energy efficiency is not one of those areas that gets as much focus as it should, but we are proud to report that all but two of our Midland Public School buildings are now Energy Star rated. That allows us to take our very needed critical general funds and drive those back into the classroom where they should. In addition, our environments were able to be enhanced by adding air conditioning in each and every single one of our school buildings that we know helps academic outcomes. We were able to do that at almost a net neutral energy cost because of the efficient systems that we put in. So our enhancements through the 2015 bond helped with our academic outcomes. And even before we heard of the dreaded COVID-19, we were able to address HVAC systems that allowed us to promote healthier environments by allowing us to control the amount of outside air that came in. In addition, we ingrained mechanical equipment that allows us to control on a micro level the outputs of some of our systems. Vacant buildings and properties, we now drive past some of the open fields that are in Midland Public Schools, and we soon forget that there were buildings on some of those sites. We remove those buildings, we remove the related maintenance cost, it improved community aesthetics, safety, and operational efficiencies. We also had to address some of the aging facilities that we had, which led us to the decision to close down some of our elementary campuses and combine them. This springboarded us into designing 21st century learning environments. And you can see through these photos, we doubled down on our technology infrastructure. Our classroom technology, we ingrained one-to-one -one devices. Our media centers have been featured in magazines and publications throughout the nation. And we we're also to build an award-winning elementary school that we still give tours to, um, to the moral of some of our regional partners. We also were able to make athletic improvements. We were able to put turf fields down, redo our gym floors. We were able to do site improvements such as paving. Our bus fleet has almost been entirely replenished. By the end of series three bonds, we'll replace our entire bus fleet. And I think something that makes us the most proud is we were able to do this in a fiscally responsible fashion. We were able to realize bid savings. We were able to take those dollars, invest them strategically and safely, which gave us additional earned interest. That program savings allowed us to complete our projects on time, under budget, and complete $14 million in additional projects than what was previously anticipated in our scope of work. We were able to build an elementary that wasn't just your traditional elementary. We were able to add those STEM components that make Central Park the special place that it is. We were able to add additional mechanical equipment, renovate additional restrooms, do more site paving, improve other building envelopes, and we were able to do athletic projects that weren't in our initial scope, such as renovating the stadium bleachers. Before we progress further, it is important for us to talk about our millage rates in comparison to some of our peers. Within our county alone, you can see that Coleman and ourselves are nearly identical in our millage rate. You all, if you've been watching the news, have seen that Coleman have been trying with their voters to be able to increase their millage rate to improve their physical campus. And you can see that Bullock Creek and Meridian are at seven mils far beyond us. This is one of those slides where I'd like to slow down. It was made very apparent to me and to our community, the actions that the Board of Education took when setting the superintendent's salary. There is a firm commitment to aligning Midland Public Schools to the highest performing districts in the state. We often receive feedback about the facilities of those districts, especially focused surrounding athletic complexes, such as the recent renovations at Grand Blanc. And you can see in this chart, when we put these comparison millage rates, that MPS falls at the bottom of that peer group. When you compare ourselves statewide and you look at the mean and the median in those comparable measures, Midland Public Schools falls below those averages as well. We'd like to take a shift now. We'd like to move from focusing on the past and move into the more exciting part of the presentation, which is focusing on our future. And as Penny noted, when our committee was vetting what we believe are some of the strategic choices that we're gonna to need to make, 
we focused on the pillars of maintaining our critical infrastructure, address the aging facilities, making sure that our utilization is optimized while also wanting to enhance our educational opportunities through expanded pre-K offerings, doubling down on our commitment to our auxiliary programming, utilizing our key investments, and also enhancing our arts and our athletic facilities. A core component of the facility assessment is to address our infrastructure. And our infrastructure components were something that our partners helped us address and identify. These parts of the infrastructure are the essential components that we believe as an administrative team will need address regardless of what our future vision are. These are critical infrastructure input and output that we need to make sure we are addressing and able to maintain our facilities in an operating fashion that we believe is conducive to an academic environment. So we're gonna ask Daryl from Barton Mallow to talk about our infrastructure needs. Yeah, I have some very uh, strict time constraints from Brian Penny, so I'll try to be fast here. Uh, yeah, we're going to try to, I don't know how we're doing with time, but I'm, I'll do my best. Um, but I just want to say thank you as well to both the board and the FFO committee for our involvement. Uh, 2024 will mark Bart Mallows and my 10th year with Midland Public Schools. And so very proud of that um, and excited to be here as part of this process uh, with you all tonight. So talking about infrastructure. Um, I think one thing I'm going to kind of talk back to is the 2003 sinking fund, the 15 bond program, as well as the energy bond in 2021. I mean, all of those things, when you think back of the projects that were put in place, really set you up for where you are now and would have a big impact on what's important going forward. Um, so we're going to work through a few of these categories, but from just like a general dollar standpoint, where you stand, um, I think the district is well positioned because of those investments and a lot of the really key projects involved infrastructure as part of the 2015 program. Um, now roof replacement uh, as part of the building envelope is, is the largest portion of the critical needs. Um, a lot of the roofs were replaced as part of the 2003 bond program. And a lot of those roofs have about a 20 year lifespan. So if you just kind of do the math, that replacement cycle kind of jumped over the 15 program. And those are the projects that are probably you know, most important as part of the infrastructure assessment. You can see some stats down there by 2026 55% of the district roofs will be 20 plus years old. So really, as Brian mentioned earlier, to avoid those kind of big one-time costs, it's time for the district to start investing and start replacing sections of roof. Uh, interior renovations, a little bit of a hodgepodge here. There was a lot of interior renovations that happened as part of the 15 program. Um, really the focus here are like original or 20 plus year old material. So, you know, flooring, you think to Jefferson classrooms as an example. Um, pool equipment, um, locker rooms, a lot of those places that are have just not seen renovations as part of recent programs. Uh, mechanical upgrades, this was like a really, as, as Brian discussed, a, a, a really main focus of the 15 program. I mean, over 225 mechanical units, 18 boilers, um, brand new uh, building management system across the district. So this was a really, um, a really key investment as part of that, but there are still some areas within the district that have older equipment, um, Jefferson, um, has some air handling equipment that's still out there. Um, Midland High School as well, there's some unit ventilators. Dow High, all of the air handlers have been replaced there, but there's some miscellaneous pieces of equipment that would be part of that. Um, Midland High has some unit ventilators that were replaced in during the 2003 program. Those are approaching that kind of 20 plus year range. So those would be included um, as part of this um, mechanical upgrades uh, portion of the assessment. Uh, electrical. So the electrical was, as you can see, is a very small number what's left to do. Uh, a lot of the power um, and um, services were upgraded as part of the 15 program. And then the 2021 energy bond replaced all the light fixtures. So you can see that that was like kind of a key, um, key investment and what's left to do is not much here. So that's, that's good news. Uh, site improvements. Um, site improvements, really the two biggest items within this 3.1 million would be the Adams bus loop extension and the Woodcrest parking lot extension. Um, the Adams is the, only is the only building that does not have a designated bus loop. So what's included in the assessment would be the cost for that. And then Woodcrest, the parking there is tight. Some of that um, um, temporary parking that we had left behind during construction is actually currently still being used. Doing a quick count, they do have less um, parking spots. It's a tighter space than uh, the rest of the elementary. So including the assessment would be the cost for that. Um, there are some areas throughout the district that have and would require some asphalt replacement. Uh, the rear of Midland High, for example, 
um, would be an example of that uh, as well as Dow High. So, but for the most part, the district's in, in a really good position with um, their site improvements. And then tech infrastructure, um, there is a desire to expand some of the access control uh, as part of that. Um, the uh, PA systems, the head end systems were replaced, but the speakers are all existing. So you've got some you know, 40, 50 year old speakers throughout the district. So um, what's included in that portion of the assessment would be replacing those speakers. Um, and then the clock system district wide as well. Uh, additionally, the emergency alert system. So that would be um, you know, a system put in place uh, for security reasons to help you know, notify uh, first responders of any incidents. And that is the infrastructure. Over All right, academic improvements. You know, we've seen this with our classroom visits and you've all been in classrooms. We know that the classroom teacher is one of the most important factors in student learning and our ability to provide teachers with the ideal learning environment really amplifies their work. So this section reflects that. It reflects an opportunity to really make ample and appropriate space where we can have flexible furniture, and uh, just the ideal situation for teachers to really uh, flourish. As noted, we uh, previously noted, we invested heavily in elementary uh, in our, our 2015 bond and created some great teaching and learning spaces for our students and teachers. So they're getting a little bit lighter touch here and the focus is primarily on our high schools. However, the elementaries do need some whiteboards and some casework. And as you know from previous conversations at the board level, we've had a, a renewed intensity around how we provide more individualized supports and interventions to students. So creating spaces that are really ideal for that will be part of this work. Uh, and that's a really important move for us. Middle schools. Um, I, I should also uh, interject that middle schools have that same need. We haven't maybe talked about it as much in our curriculum committee, but lots of individualized interventions and supports happening in our middle schools in less than ideal spaces. So this will be a focus with our middle schools. We also have a need in our middle schools to think about teaching and learning spaces for our CTE feeder programs, our life skills classes, our project lead the way classes. Uh, we have created those courses and then put them in classrooms kind of by default rather than by design. And what we really want to do is design spaces that meet those needs so that those programs can really be maximized. We also want to recognize that with the rate at which information and technology is changing, we need to be prepared to respond to that. So this idea of emerging programs and positioning ourselves with really flexible space that's technology rich, high use, and can be iterated over time based on the program that we wanna put in there. That's what we're looking for uh, in those emerging program spaces. Common theme at the high school, emerging uh, technology and, and programs and creating ideal spaces for those. And we also wanna to tend to our CTE programs and our life skills classes there. We have some really amazing CTE programs and they're working in pretty antiquated classrooms uh, and labs or shops. So this will um, be a really joyful moment if we can make this happen. Our high schools, uh, as most of you know, because you've spent time there, have original classrooms. Many of them are very oddly shaped and teachers have to work extra hard to try to figure out how to configure tables and chairs to really maximize learning. So the opportunity to renovate classrooms could be a game changer for our teachers and students as well in creating those ideal learning environments. Uh, arts, athletic, and play is our next section. And, you know, this is just exciting as the athletic or as the academic improvements because we know to have well rounded students, they need all of these experiences as well. I'll give you a minute to take a look at how this breaks out with arts improvement, playground upgrades, the Midland Community Stadium, and then our high school athletics and middle school athletics. We have award-winning art and music programs, and they are working also in some pretty antiquated spaces. So this gives attention to that and a refresh. We're also keenly aware of the need for additional new, more modern equipment and band instruments. Those are aging, our inventory is aging. So this will tend to a refresh for those. 
We know Central Auditorium was renovated in the 2015 bond and we're really proud of that facility. It's quite beautiful. However, it doesn't exactly meet all of our needs. So we're gonna look at some enhanced seating and stage enhancements. We have a high number of students participating in those programs and uh, this will certainly recognize that and accommodate for that. Several of our elementaries, I think we heard that, uh, experienced some issues, particularly with drainage in the spring. It is problematic because it limits student use and access to those facilities. And we in our elementary have done a lot of learning lately, haven't we, Jen, about the importance of play and physical activity for learning. So modernizing these uh, spaces, bringing them up um, to a great standard, and of course, making them more accessible for all of our students will be a really important move. Midland Community Stadium. Again, we're proud of this shared facility and the opportunity to take it to the next level for our athletes, our guests, and our spectators. We will need significant upgrades to bathrooms, concessions, and team rooms, and additional storage here. And we are gonna put some work into uh, kind of a more defined entrance that could improve flow and considerably uh, in increase safety. Our Dow High Outdoor Athletic Complex has changed significantly in recent years due to the generous contributions of our community and the strategic investment of the district. The need here is to improve the experience of our school community when they use this space. So making it a more complete facility with concessions, storage, bathrooms, and parking. And we're recognizing now that the new standard, the trend is for turf, for softball, and baseball fields. So that would be part of this work. And there will be some work inside uh, in the athletic areas as well, particularly locker room renovations, which are also needed at Midland High. So that's a recurring theme. We'll see that in middle school here in a minute too. Uh, Midland High will see uh, similar interior improvements and upgrades also to the softball and baseball fields. And as I said, our middle school athletics, our locker rooms need some attention. And we are, have, have heard from the community for sure that our outside track and field area really needs some work. We need to resurface our exterior courts as well. All of these components represent a really considerable investment in arts, athletic, and play. And again, we know that these experiences really enrich our students and contribute to the excellence we have here at Midland Schools. Brian, come talk to us about technology. While it may not be as exciting as stadium improvements and track improvements, technology to us is absolutely essential to all of our operations. And please don't squint too much at this chart. I'll give you just a quick overview. But we have a fleet of over 10,000 devices district-wide, and the use of technology to enhance our instructional delivery is deeply embedded in our pedagogy and a critical skill set to develop in our students to be able to thrive in all of their future endeavors. And as you will see at the regular board meeting this evening when we conclude this special session, um, devices, they have a useful life to them and they do need to be replaced. Along with our devices comes critical infrastructure, such as classroom whiteboards, servers, switches, fibers, and all of the things that you approve at every single board meeting for Dave to be able to allow us to deliver within our technology aspect. Integrating the replacement cycle into the bond frees up the general fund to focus on driving our resources into academic, extra, and co-curricular programming. Furniture. This was by far the number one area that was identified by all of our administrators when we were walking through with the exception of Central Park Elementary. Um, as you all know, Central Park Elementary was blessed to be able to receive all brand new modern furniture that is a little bit different than what is traditional. And our other building principals realize that there is um, a desire amongst their teachers, amongst their students, amongst um, all stakeholders to be able to enhance their learning facilities with modern furniture. You can go with the traditional route. The traditional route would be approximately $5,000 per square foot. You could also go in the more modern route, which would probably put you in around the $10 per square foot cost to be able to replace furniture district-wide. District that would be a process that we go through to see 
what needs modern versus what needs traditional. But again, this was an area that truly was a high, high need identified amongst our administrative team. Buses, while they don't get much attention as well too, I did mention earlier that by the time series three is concluded, we'll have replaced all of our buses. Um, but that life cycle goes on. Just like technology, buses have a life cycle to them. We put a lot of miles on those buses and this bond would also allow us over the next cycle to be able to replace all 54 that are currently in our fleet as well too. As we said with technology, the ability to do that through the bond does free up our general fund to be able to let that focus on students. We're gonna shift to some of the challenges that we've seen and it has been stated since the 2015 facility study that Northeast Middle School was an area of focus for a future time. Now is that future time. Now is the time to open up this community conversation. It was determined at that time not to heavily invest in that facility as it was nearing a critical decision point. We said that critical decision point would be in about 10 years. Well, here we are. That time has arrived. Um, we feel it's appropriate that we have Dale from French and Associates talk a little bit about the middle school. Um, he's very well positioned to do this as he's built many modern middle schools. It can work us through this scenario. Thank you, Brian. And I would just uh, take a quick moment to say thank you as well. It's great to be here this evening. Um, and I do want to talk about the middle schools a little bit specifically, um, as um, Brian already stated. Um, in the 2015 bond, um, there were some decisions that were deferred, if you will, at the middle school level, because we knew that you'd be coming up on the end, likely end of the life cycle of a Northeast Middle School. Um, and what's exciting about this next step in deciding what to do at the middle school level is it does give you a chance to extend upward into the middle school grade levels, some of those um, transformations of the learning environments uh, for the middle schools. So um, we know at a minimum within the assessment, um, when you look through it, you see that there are some things, even if you don't make any academic improvements to your existing middle schools, that there are going to be some end of life cycle needs such as roofing and, and uh, mechanical equipment. And then if you decide to layer on top of that, there's a range of costs that, that obviously go up from there that would allow you to um, make um, academic uh, improvements, enhancements to the middle schools, and the, then the larger scale um, investment would be to actually make that replacement cycle at Northeast. Um, I think it's important to know that you're, you are at somewhat of a crossroads, and I think it's also important to note that now may actually be a very strategic time to reinvest in the replacement of Northeast Middle School. It, this, this slide illustrates that if you choose one of these three tracks, if you will, sort of the stat score or the minimum investment in your middle schools, you're going to likely extend the um, life of Northeast maybe 20 to 25 years. If you make a more slightly more significant investment, you might extend it up to as much as 30 years, but ultimately you will still reach the end of the life of that building some point later down the road, regardless of how much you spend. And as you can see from this chart, if you defer that um, reinvestment to that 25 or 30 year um, extension, you would actually end up overall investing more at the middle school level in your facilities if you decided to defer that replacement cost to that point down the road. As I said, another exciting aspect of this is to be able to really transform the learning environment for the middle school students in your district um, current day middle school would look much different than the one that you or I attended. Um, similar to Central Park Elementary, most likely you would um, create um, ac academic hubs or some type of grade level uh, suite for students to take all of their core courses in a, um, a hub uh, within the building. Um, again, similar to the learning suites that we see at Central Park Elementary, but at a grade level appropriateness for middle school students. And the nice thing about, um, and you'll see it reflected again as we move forward with further discussing with your committees how to approach the middle school solution, we do firmly believe that we can overlay that same concept of learning environments onto Jefferson and provide an equitable uh, learning environment for the students at that building as well. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Brian.
it was apparent um, in the last bond of those discussions and everything that Dale just said that we needed to address the middle school question at some point. But something that has emerged in the past couple of years is a discussion around our elementary and pre-primary offerings. Penny indicated this in the beginning, that trends in early childhood education at the state level and also our level are that there is a very apparent need for us to be able to expand our pre-K offerings. Um, I just attended a meeting with community foundation partners where there is a regional effort going on to enhance these opportunities. And we believe that in the, mid the middle of public schools that we could be partners in this. Um, to do that, we have to address a couple of needs. One is space. Um, Carpenter, our pre-primary center was built in 1926. Um, while there is um, some beauty and aesthetic value in that building, we know that it's one of our oldest buildings and we are space limited there due to some other programming in there. Indeed, we have another issue coming up as well too, which is our population growth, which is leading to over and under utilization within our district. If you guys read the Midland Daily News a couple of weeks back, there was an article about Siebert having record attendance this year. And upon doing a deeper analysis of that, it was not an increase in school of choice. It simply was students that were moving into that zone. If you studied our zoning in the Midland Public Schools, Siebert largely composes the northern section of our district. We know that there's growth in that area and that's causing constraints not only on Siebert, but also on Woodcrest and we predict Adams in the near future as well too. So we need to address some of those. Perhaps more important is the need for other spaces that have emerged not only to enhance our focus on pre-K, but also with our auxiliary classes as well too. We have doubled down on the importance of those experiences for our students. We've expanded our music curriculum offering in time. We've done the same in art and some of the space constraints that we have, you'll hear it said a lot, we have art on a cart. And we believe that we can do better than that in the middle of public schools and have a space for those students to do what it is that they need. In addition, it's important to acknowledge the importance of the ESA as our partner. As you all know, as board members, there are ESA classrooms and our elementaries as well, too. Those are Midland Public School students in our eyes. We truly believe in the least restrictive environment and the best opportunity for them are in our buildings. And as Mr. Jaster has to do every single year, there's an additional need for space and we wanna be able to provide that and be the best educational partners for students that have some of the highest academic needs. All of those converge into a discussion point around the need for more elementary space. And there's a couple of possible scenarios, just as Dale had done before. You could build additions onto our existing elementaries. It is challenging when you're looking at the physical sites that we currently have. A lot of those are kind of jammed into constrained um, situations and building additions on, we could, it would be challenging, it would cost you in around the $16 million area. You could also replace our pre-primary center as well too. Um, you could remove that building. Again, it was built in 1926, build a new pre-primary center that has additional spaces, but you'd have to do a hybrid between the two to be able to address the overall needs. You'd have to build certain additions and you could also um, replace the pre-primary center. But there also is an additional consideration and that would be building a new neighborhood elementary. And if you did build a new neighborhood elementary, that would allow us then to absorb some of the population from some of the other schools and also free up then spaces within our elementary buildings. I'm gonna shift. We've been talking about topics and isolation, but we now as a committee spent a very large amount of time considering and contemplating ways that these isolated issues could be paired together into solutions or strategic scenarios. Again, our committee put diligence and time and deep thought into anchoring back to each of these core principles as we reviewed and developed strategic scenarios. The exciting part, as I've talked about before, is when reviewing these scenarios, how can it best position the Midland Public Schools to address our critical infrastructure needs today but also to position us into shaping what we believe is tomorrow's excellence. Please don't try and squint. Know that as a committee, we spent again over a year and a half, we have reviewed over nine scenarios 
They were A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and I. Again, I'm not going to go through each of them, but we did review alternate grade configurations, the repurposing of buildings, and also studied programmatic impacts as well, too. We did an in-depth evaluation of each of these scenarios. We looked at utilization within the buildings, the percentages, the classroom occupancy. We looked at different grade configurations. We looked at different cost models. And of course, we looked at geographic mapping as well, too. We're going to focus in on two possible scenarios that as a committee, we believe are potential solutions to address, again, not these issues that we have in isolation, but as a collaborative approach. The first possible scenario that emerged was to build a new elementary and to replace Northeast Middle School. When you look at this scenario and you look at the setup of the Midland Public Schools, it would not change very drastically in this scenario. What we'd be doing is adding a new elementary school and we would be replacing the middle school. That means that Carpenter, the pre-primary center would have to be either repurposed or demoed and the same is true for Northeast Middle School as well. We did spend a lot of time to look at the building utilization to make sure that in doing this, it would afford us the opportunity to be able to free up those spaces as needed for our early childhood programming, for auxiliary, for our ESA purposes as well too. And again, in the amount of time that we have here with only 10 short minutes left to go, I can't go through each and every single one of these small percentages, but what this proves to us is that this scenario would work and it would allow us to be able to meet those ideals. This does take some time for us to chat about, and it is good for us to talk that there has not been a specific location identified yet, but analysis for us points to the area north of the mall, somewhere in the area of Commerce Drive. Again, we talked about in the Midland Daily News, the article about Siebert and about the attendance issues that we're having in that zone, and we believe that an elementary position in this area would be best for what would be cause for an eventual redistricting. I know that raises lots of questions. Know that we've acquired software to assist us with the possibility of redistricting. Yes, we've mocked up a few certain scenarios, but it would not be good of us to make those decisions right now because in terms of redistricting, we know that that's a bigger community conversation. And of course, we want to get everyone's input on the potential ramifications. But in mocking up those scenarios and spending some hours on doing that, we do not believe that any student currently enrolled in any of these schools would be affected. This will be a longer term phased and approach, but we do believe that with that rezoning, it could help alleviate some of the issues that we have. There is another scenario, as stated before, multiple scenarios were vetted. To still accomplish the goals that we've stated, it was important to us to explore alternate pathways to be able to accomplish this. And one scenario that emerged that was cost comparative would be the reconfiguration of grade level pathways that would eventually lead to an emergence of a true community high school. We'll pause at this a little more than we did the previous configuration because this is different than what you are currently used to. Again, we have a need for space at our elementary schools. Instead of building an additional elementary school, you could trim off a grade level at your current elementary schools. That means that you would then be offering your PK opportunities, your preschool opportunities through fourth grade, and you'd be creating an additional transition at our upper levels. You can see that in this configuration, you would create an intermediate school at the fifth and sixth grade level, which would have approximately 1,100 students. You could then transition those students into a junior high experience that could be hosted at Midland High School, which would have in the neighborhood, we're predicting of around 17 to 1,800 students. And if you were to build a new community high school, it would have approximately 1,750 to 1,850 students um, that would serve the 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. In this scenario, this would address Carpenter pre-primary being repurposed or coming offline, Northeast Middle School coming offline as well too, and we'd have some reimagination to do with the Jefferson campus and there have been some certain ideas about robotics and some other ideas as well too. It's important to note that in this new high school, there are additional opportunities that be considered and those additional opportunities could be an enhanced auditorium, a community pool, and also the chance for a new and revised stadium as well too. Again, not to go in depth on the specific percentages here, 
all that these specific percentages are doing are showing proof of concept. Um, within your board packet, you do have these percentages, but as a committee, we vetted these to prove that this concept would work as well too. As stated in the previous scenario, there is not a location that's been identified. If this is something that board and community feedback favors further exploration of the concept, this is something that we would study further on possible locations, possible sites, and some of the advantages and disadvantages therein involved. As a budget summary of the two scenarios, again, we wanted to talk about cost comparative solutions. And you can see that in scenario one, you're in around the $236 million range. And that would again, build a new elementary somewhere in our Northern zone and replace Northeast Middle School. In scenario two, which is the reconfiguration with an eventual pathway to a community high school, you can see that it actually comes in cheaper at about $210 million. And we put a separate green bar off to the right because we have heard from our communities, our constituents and our stakeholders that there is the desire at least to have a conversation about some of these additional items. There should be a conversation about a community pool. There should be a conversation about not just enhancing our current auditorium, but possibly replacing it with a larger venue. And also talking about maybe a revised stadium complex that we keep hearing something along the lines of what you see in Grand Blank. So those additional considerations, even if they are not a part of a scenario one or a scenario two, are something that we are seeking feedback from the board and from our stakeholders on whether there is a considerable desire for us as a school district to be able to explore a 1,000 seat auditorium, a 12 lane competition pool or an auditorium to have a renew and revised stadium complex. And we would be remiss if we didn't talk about enhancing our robotic structures as well too. And I'm gonna to transition to Penny. She's gonna talk about the next steps for us in the process. As I stated at the top of our presentation, we at Midland Public Schools are an essential element in the overall success of our community. You heard some ideas tonight that are bold and forward thinking and do represent our aspirations to reach the highest level of excellence for our students, staff, and community. These ideas require a lot more dialogue, particularly as we consider our responsibility to be the best stewards of the resources entrusted to our care and leadership. We know engaging our community in this process is absolutely imperative. The community input process that we used for the 2015 bond, it worked. It yielded us a plan with great support from our community. So we are looking to replicate a similar process. That means multiple opportunities for conversation and input from you as board members, from our students, our staff, and our entire community, and certainly engaging our community leaders. Focus panels are in our future, surveys are in our future, lots of discussion and dialogue. This represents where we've been, and again, where we need to head next. A project of this scope and importance, uh, we're committed to not rushing it. We're committed to forward progress, how, however, and ensuring that we continue to move forward and get us to an actual plan because the needs that you heard tonight are real and our students and staff and community deserve to have those needs met. So uh, the next steps right now are to hear from you as board members. As we move into the discussion phase, um, I'm skipping over the question slide and just going to put this here for us to take a look at. As we move into this dialogue and discussion phase, I'm just asking you to anchor yourself back to these priorities, certainly to our vision statement and to our aspirations for excellence as a team. I invite you to ask any questions or engage in dialogue and Brian has a mic and we have our friends here uh, who can help us as well. Floor is open, President okay. McFarland. Any questions? I guess I'll, I can start. <clears throat> Just want to say thank you to the FFO committee because I know Brad, John, and John, you three of you have put in an incredible amount of work. Um, Penny and Brian, thanks for your leadership on it as well because I know it's not 
not easy. And I also want to say thank you for putting a bold vision out there because it's when we don't shy away from hard questions that we can have a real community conversation about what to do. As I went, as I listened to the presentation, you get goosebumps about what's possible. And when we start, it was, a, it was evident to me that the committee started with our vision statement about ensuring an equitable and collaborative and inclusive culture and environment for our students to succeed. Um, I'm excited to have the conversation. I don't know if I have a, a strong opinion one way or the other at this moment. It's a lot to take in. Um, and I'm sure there's reasons that the three of you have decided to present these two options, aside from the other eight that I'm sure you've and umpteen others that you've you've looked at, but are there are there reasons that you chose these two in particular over the other A through I that you examined? Well, uh, <clears throat> I think these two options and the ability to use what we have to start and some of the numbers in the United States that you need four hundred million dollars. If you want to just start going building bridge, it's you're you're up with the um I think the assessment has been a, a great exercise in um, you know, really taking part of what we have, what we can use for the long term, and really making, I think, having to make some harder choices about what we can do. The building is often big. Uh, you know, it's, we got our money for that. Uh, it's, it's on the first level. Once you start there, then you just kind of end up with what the research If you look at long term utilization, earth rate, potential enrollment numbers, one of the options can be more controversial than the other. I think it's at least, we're at least going to have a, a robust conversation. And I think these two options allow us to take the data and take the data. You kind of now. start with, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty used to having um, a lot of ideas brought forward, a lot of, you know, concepts. And so, like, our role is to give you information around those, around cost, facility utilization, and then, you know, how would that, um, you know, come to be. So, in 15, it was less ab about um, maybe different buildings. It was more about just the infrastructure piece of it. And there were a lot of things that were scaled back out of that. So, if you look at some of the things that showed up today, such as furniture, um, as you went through the process last time and settled in on a dollar amount that made sense, some of those things fell off. Some of the athletics items fell off. Some of the technology fell off. So, I mean, there's usually this, you kind of start here and you end up somewhere else. And um, I'd say that's kind of a similar process that we're going through now. Before, certainly before my time, I would stop and think about Yes. Three of us thought, let's start, let's not come forward with one plan and try to sell it to the vote. We're going to start here and identify what the issues are. We're going to engage the community in discussion about what's our long term plan. And then we're going to put something, hopefully, hopefully, before the vote is over. 
Thanks for clarifying that. It is it is what we're after. We're after board input to know how to refine our thinking so that we have some solid pieces to take out for focus groups and survey. That's what we need from you in and terms and of Penny, guidance. this is not a choose A or B scenario, right? When we're going to Correct. the focus groups and, and addressing the community, right. we're seeking input. Yes, I think, I think our best position is to have several scenarios options the other considerations that by brian presented around the pool auditorium i think i believe those are all ideas that we should take to the community to see where they stand in supporting those I don't believe our analysis has gone that deep okay. yet. Okay. So we would need to, to reconcile that yes. as well as just other implications educationally as yes. to what that looks like. Okay. Good question that. though. Is that you? Okay. <laughs> so knowing that this is not a, uh, knowing <laughs> that this is not a one or How can how can these different structures know whether whether uh, they excel in the seventy seven to ninety one million five six or the kind of the standard structures that we're so I don't know if there's any data. Yeah, that's a great question. We need to dig more deeply into that. I do know there is a body of research around those transition points for students at different age groups mm -hmm. and acknowledging that there is an additional transition in there that we would need to support. So um, absolutely, we can get uh, more information about the educational impact of scenario two. Penny, is this available online for anybody who may have missed the meeting to review and not yet. Sure. Uh, okay. We haven't shared it. We wanted to share it with the board first. This right. meeting will be posted. Folks can certainly take a look at that. If your wish is to post these slides, we certainly can do that. I think in isolation, without the context, it might not have as much meaning. So I hope that folks would choose to watch the recording of the presentation. Okay. Any other questions or comments? So our intentions are to engage the board committee structure for additional uh, conversations. Our curriculum committee would be a great place to talk about the educational implications. So in January, we'll be making those rounds. I welcome uh, anyone uh, to reach out to Brian or I if you have questions that come to you after this, because I'm sure those would be good for the whole board to hear and we can start to curate that list and share out information accordingly. Is there a, I know we don't have a set timeline do we have an end date to achieve what we're looking for in terms of gathering information and making a decision to move forward? We don't have a defined date. Okay. That is part of the input that we need from you. We have a lot happening right now in our district, and this is an important piece too. Uh, certainly, uh, the board superintendent search is critical, and there's a short timeline for that. Uh, you'll have before you tonight the resolution for uh, the operating millage election in May of, of 24. We certainly want to tend to that. I believe we have the capacity to keep moving forward with this exploration and bring us uh, to a, a decision point about what to take to the team, so, or to the community rather. My hope is that through the January committee structure that I can get enough input that Brian and I can come back and say, okay, here's where we think we are and bring this back to the board possibly in February uh, just for one more check-in with you. How does that feel? Possible, reasonable? I think it's possible, yeah. And then we can make a decision yeah. about the focus groups, surveys, et cetera. The needs are real and I wanna keep us moving forward. Our, our students deserve this.
lots to think about and very exciting. Great. Um, if there are no more, Brad, do you have something? Yep. Um, I'm all for posting this. I think that we need to look at a couple items that are in it, though. Okay. Um, could you expand on what that means to the public on going from a K facility to a pre-K facility? What does that mean? Does that mean how many sections are we talking about? What age groups of children are we targeting? What does pre-K mean to them? Yeah, we didn't really talk about that very much tonight. And actually, it's part of what we hope to be an expansion of those offerings uh, and where those will fall if they are um, moved out into the elementaries is yet to be determined. But we think there is an opportunity for every school to have some presence of a pre-K program, whether that is developmental kindergarten, um, our GSRP programming or our preschool programming. OK. I think we have to dive into that just a little bit deeper mm -hmm. because when we are making the step in scenario number two, going from K to five, pre-K to four, yes, we are losing a big chunk of students uh, in almost all of those elementary. So through this process, we're going to need to identify what size classes are those or what could they be? Mm -hmm. in those pre-k offerings so that we know that we can utilize these buildings yes. to the best and yes. that we have the knowledge of where we're headed with that i'll also remind you part of that is that auxiliary space in elementaries so even if a grade level is moved to another building and those pre-k come in that additional space we have intentions for that uh, with our auxiliary programming brian's art on a cart and um mm -hmm. yeah so but we can analyze that more closely okay um Obviously, Brian mentioned on redistricting with, that we could talk about in the future. That's not part of this at this point in time. Yeah. Um, but we also need to take into consideration Central Park and potential of influx of children because of the new construction in that district. So I think that those numbers may actually go up versus going down. So I think we need to look at Central Park a little bit closer and where we're headed with that one um, before we post this. But I would like to look at some of these numbers a little bit further, but once we do that, I would love to get this out in front of the people so that they can review it at their leisure. Whether they watch the video, that'd be great. If they don't, that's okay too. But for them to look at it, ponder it, um, you asked about the nine different steps. Um, if kind of if we did the nothing approach and just tackled what has to be done, what is that number? 46 million. So we have a baseline. Right. So wherever you want to go with the ceiling, we need 50 million to just take care of what we have and make sure it's safe for our kids. So valid point that's a baseline that you need to get out to everybody that's that's the start anything on beyond that is what we have to have the discussion about because we haven't made any decisions we know we need 50 million to do yeah. absolute minimum but where we head from there it's going to take a lot of input from the people and a lot of work on our side as well and that's 50 million above and beyond the renewal of our current Yes. Yeah, that's Just correct. To clarify that as well. The operating millage. Yeah, the yeah. operating millage that we'll ask you to do tonight is not for this. Right. Um, the funds that we have set aside for construction are from our 2015 bond campaign. As I've talked about with our FFO committee, we're currently in series three of that, which is basically all dedicated to our technology and our busing fleet infrastructure. Yes, sir. Very fair statement. Yes. Yeah, I think your graph pointed that out. Uh, it was forty-eight million dollars, wasn't it, at the end of the life cycle? Yeah, if you wait all the way to the end of that refresh, if you chose to do a twenty-five or thirty-year refresh, the, the you saw the delta. It's it's close to fifty million overall expenditure, if you kick it that far down the road. Even in the here and now, yes. 
there are things that need to be done there. Yes, absolutely. So Brian, before we publish this, can you update this slide so that we know how much a one mill in our community raises for us? Just so voters can, unless I missed it in the presentation. Nope, we can do that for you. Any additional discussion? Questions? Okay. Awesome, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank all right, um, I will take a motion to adjourn this meeting and then we will open the next one. Make a motion to adjourn the special meeting. Support, motion by Phil, support by John Hatfield, and we will take five in between.